Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Today's sermon by Dr. Bill Waddell is in Luke chapter 9, A Glimpse of Glory. We are now in the book of Luke back again. We've been out for a while, not out, but we've just been around it a lot because we've been looking at this whole issue of Luke 9, 23, which is discipleship. And how much we have gotten from what that actually means. And uh, so we spent nine weeks together on that topic. And could have spent a lot more because what is, I mean, discipleship is the whole Bible, really, truly. But just to, get, just to get the basics takes us nine weeks to do that. So we're back in Luke chapter 9, though, and we're continuing our progression. And I'm excited about that, ready to move on. Uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 26, we're going to be there in uh, just a bit. We're going to be looking at this next event that takes place in the life and ministry, earthly ministry of Jesus. What, if, if I told you to uh, tell me the first thing that comes to your mind, or that's what I don't want you to tell me, but I want you to think about it, of, of whatever happened in Jesus' life, one thing just pops in your mind. What's the first thing that pops? Maybe it's a, I don't know, maybe it's, you know, the, the classics, his birth, his resurrection, his death. Maybe it's some miracle. You know, one of the things that, that, that pops in my mind when I think of the events of Jesus' life, I, I look at this woman who was caught in the midst of adultery, and the conclusion of that story was, he says to her, neither do I condemn you. you know, wow, that's powerful. I mean, you know, I, not, I'm, not, I'm not in her sin, but I'm a sinner. I need the same words. Neither do I. That's so comforting. And may, what, what, what would it be for you? I just want you to think about that. Uh, what, what events in the life of Je- Jesus' ministry? Maybe it's a healing. Maybe it's some resurrection. Maybe it's, uh, you know, maybe it's the angel singing at his birth. I don't know, you know, what, whatever event. I just want you to have that in your mind. Peg it for a second there. I, I say that to say this. I bet it's not the same as some of his disciples. And obviously their experiences were different. They saw it all. They heard it all. They saw the teachings. They saw the preachings, they heard all that, they saw the things that he did, they saw the faces of the people, they saw the woman, you know, called adultery, they saw these things. So, so, so in some ways, because their experience was different, you should expect that their, the things that would stick to their brains were different. But there's three different disciples here that I want us to point out to, want to look at today, who had an experience with Jesus that no one else did. I mean, not the other disciples, not nobody. And because of this experience, this actually becomes a pinnacle for them. I mean, above the resurrection, above his birth, above all the things that they could possibly say, and we know that because we have the testimony of two of them on the, on the very event. Here's, here's one of them. One, Peter, James, and John. Here's Peter's words. Here's what he says. Here's just in his book. Here's much later. He says, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. What's he talking about? That could be his whole life, right? I mean, we, everything he did was majestic, I guess you could say. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such a declaration as this was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. We ourselves heard this declaration made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. What's he talking about? He's talking about this event. He's talking about something different. He's talking about something that only he and two other disciples got to see. John speaks of the same thing here in John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. The glory as of the only, the, the Son of the Father, the full of grace and truth. Wow. Uh, what is this event? Well, that's, that's our topic today. Let's take a look at it. Luke chapter 26. I'm sorry, Luke chapter 9, verse 26. Something happens here. So Jesus has just gotten off talking about the fact he, he's, he's, he's still at Caesarea Philippi. He's still at a place where he asks the question, and here's the answer, I guess you could say. Here's the answer for all of us he's going to give us here. He asks the question, who do you say that I am? That is the most important question you'll ever answer. Your eternity is going to be determined by the answer you give to the question of who is Jesus. So if Jesus is anything other than the absolute Lord of the universe, Savior of the world, then that's going to switch it for you. It's going to change it for you. There's only one eternity for you, and it's, a place, and it's in a place called hell. The Bible's very clear about that. If Jesus is anything other than the God, God of very God, who, can only, who alone can save, then you cannot be saved because you're a sinner. And you're going to forever be separated from God. But if Jesus is indeed the Savior, if he is indeed everything, and if you have trusted him, then like I said, it's a total switch. Literally, from death to life. So let's look, look at what happens here. He, he's, he's gone on, talked about the discipleship, talked about the fact that he was going to die, uh, and, and asked the question, who do you say that I am? And then now he gives this this very, very straightforward statement of verse 26. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory. When he comes. Not if. Not 
possible. Now, it's a possibility I might come back. Well, no. When? Not if. And the glory of the Father and his holy angels. So when he comes back, so he, so he says, I'm going to leave, and I'm going to come back. So if he leaves, where is he right now when he says this statement? Oh, well, he's terra firma right here. So if he leaves, he's leaving here. But if he comes back, he's coming back where? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right here. In, in, in his Father's glory, he says, but I say to you truthfully, there are some of those standing here who shall not taste of death until they see the kingdom of God. In other words, he says the kingdom of God is yet future. It's going to be a huge, glorious thing, and, and, and it's going to be a massive thing, and it's going to be a very judgmental thing, depending on what, what's, how you answer the question of where, who, is, who is Jesus to you. But, but nonetheless, there's going to be some standing here. Notice there's 12 standing there. There's only some of the, of the 12 that are going to need to see something very special. He goes immediately into this, what's, what happens here in verse 28. Some eight days after these sayings, it came about that he took Peter, James, and John. Now, why does he take these three guys with him? Some people say because they were, John and James were teenagers, and Peter, of course, is a loose cannon. You've got to keep those kind of people close to you at all times. <laughs> I don't really know. He picks these guys on regular occasions. Garden of Gethsemane, here on the Mount of Transfiguration. Nonetheless, here we are, verse 29. While he was praying, the appearance of his face became different, and his clothing became white and gleaming. Literally, Matthew says, his, his face shone like the sun. When's the last time you went out and go out and look at the midday sun? Don't do it, by the way, <laughs> because it'll mess you up. <laughs> it may not be good for your eyes. His face shone like the sun. His, his, his clothing became white and gleaming. The word literally there is like lightning, like super bright. And behold, two men were talking with him. So boom, he's changed, and now the scenery's changed, circumstances have changed, and they were not, none other than Moses and Elijah. How do they know they were Moses and Elijah? I don't know. They have a name tag on. I have no idea. They didn't introduce themselves. We don't know. We just know that people, they know who they were. And who's appearing and, and appearing in glory were speaking with him about his departure, about accomplished in Jerusalem. So he's talking about his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. Okay. It's scheduled it's according, to the, according to the plans. This wasn't something that snuck up on Jesus at all. This is something that's been, been from heaven. And so now these two important individuals from the Old Testament show up and they're discussing those same events. Now, Peter and his companions have been overcome with sleep. <laughs> Holy cow, these guys sleep through a lot of important events. When they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him, and it came about when these were parting from him. So Elijah and Moses were leaving. Peter says, you know, wait a minute. Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not realizing what he was saying. It's kind of classic Peter. And while he was saying this, a cloud formed and began to overshadow them, and they were afraid as they were entering the cloud and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. That's the event that Peter and John are talking about. It's this event. Now, James, we don't have any writings from James. James died very early, the first apostle to be martyred. We don't have any writings from him, but I'd be willing to bet if you, two out of the three pick this event of all the events of Jesus' life, I bet James was along the same lines. They, they finally saw something that, that they had longed to see. Who is Jesus really? Is he just a miracle worker? There's a lot of miracle workers in the Bible. I mean, God did a lot of things. God can do, do anything he wants to through anybody he chooses. So how, how can he be special when we have other miracle workers in the Bible? We even have people that raise people from the dead in the Bible. They're just regular men, regular people. How is Jesus different? Well, he's different in every way, every single way. So, so, so let's back up for just a second, though. So after Jesus' public death, very public, right? Nothing more public than hanging naked on a cross. That's public. That's, that's why they did it. They did it to stop you from doing whatever he did. Now, he declared himself the king of the Jews, which is, I don't see anybody else doing that, but that's, that's why they killed him. He, he never appears publicly again after that. He resurrects, but he never appears publicly. He only, he only comes to those who believed in him. He comes to the 12 in the upper room. He comes to uh, the, the, some of the apostles along the shores of Galilee says he appears to 500 of, of his faithful at one time. But publicly, never again. Those who crucified him, those who chanted against him, those who nonetheless laid the palm trees in front of him on, on Monday, but who were chanting crucify him on Thursday. I mean, that's, uh, you know, he never appears publicly to them again. But he is going to come back publicly. In fact, it's going to be the most public event there ever was. 
How do you get more public than CNN and, I don't know, Fox News and all this stuff? Well, Jesus has a way, and I want to explain that way to you. It's going to be so incredibly public. It's, it's the most public, public thing there ever was. But all they ever saw of Jesus was that he's just human. Well, he's just a regular human being. He's just a regular man. They're in their eyes... But Jesus makes a promise and makes a prediction over here in Matthew 26, and here's what he says. So this is on, on trial before the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin. Here's what he says. I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting, notice, no, it won't be just me privately, you're going to see me publicly. You will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of glory. So coming from where? Somewhere out there to down here. You're going to see this. He says that to these guys who are, who are crucifying him. He's predicting this glorious event, this return. Like he says, this, as, when he comes in his Father's glory, what's that going to be like? The Bible tells us that his return is going to be so public that no one will have to tell you that it happens. In fact, if something happens, some weird thing happens, and someone has to tell you, you know it's not Jesus. That's what Jesus says. If you have to be told, it's not me. Because his coming will be so public that literally every eye will see him. How many eyes do you have? I got two. Both are going to see him. No one will have to tell you. No one will have to come knock on your door and say, hey, did you see what happened? All kinds of important events, by the way, happen that way, and they're important. But if you weren't watching television, or I don't know if you're out fishing or something, oh, you didn't, I didn't see that. Well, it won't be that way with Jesus. When Jesus comes back in his glory, the glory will be such, it will be so public that no one will have to tell you. Here's, here's some of the whispers we get of how that's going to be. This is Revelation chapter 6. So, so awe-inspiring, so terrifying will his public appearing be. Notice, the sky, it says, was split apart like a scroll when it was rolled up. This is Revelation 6. Every mountain and island is removed from its places. That's pretty public. Then every, it names these different, every man, woman, child, every great person, every less person. I just box it all in with the words, every person. Hid themselves. This is a future event in prophecy coming. Hid themselves in the caves among the rocks of the mountains, and they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, hide us from the sight of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. How bad's it got to be? How bad has it got to be that it's better for a rock to crush you than to look on his face? That's going to be real public. That's super public. That's super evident. No one's having to talk to you about it. No one's having to tell you. No one's having to say, hey, click on this link and go watch the YouTube because I was there. Mm -mm, none of that. None of that. Every eye. Here's Revelation 7, 1, 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, just like he says. Just like it's predicted, just like Jesus promised. Coming from where? Out there to where? Down here. He's coming with the clouds. Every, how many eyes you have? Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Why? Because it's going to be that scary. That scary. It's going to be that, 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 that awesome, that amazing, that overwhelming. Here, here's the result of his appearing. Like I said, how can you get more public than the description you have here? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. So these guys witness a glimpse of glory. They see it. It's so special. It's so spellbinding. It becomes the pinnacle of, of all the things that these guys see Jesus do and go through when they write about something that the first thing that pops their minds, the most amazing experience they had with Jesus was this thing, this, this moment in time they had up on a mountain with him. Just three of them. But it was so spellbinding, it was so amazing, it was so altering to their life that that's the thing they pick. Well, Jesus is not going to come out for a glimpse. He's going to come out for a permanent stay. And it's going to be the same Jesus that they saw on the mountain, the same way he looks there. And it's going to be so public, notice, that, that the knowledge of him, knowledge of that glory, is going to fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. I don't know when the last time you went out to the ocean, but the waters completely cover the sea. Like they're all, it's all under. So that's public. Very, very, the most public event there ever is going to be. And it is this glorious, terrifying public appearance that Jesus is referring to here in verse 26. So in order to give them assurance of a yet future thing, 
It's yet future. Even today, it's yet future. And they were 2,000 years ago. It gives them assurance of a yet future thing of his return. He gives them a preview, a glimpse of what that will be like. How you have seen me to this point is not how it will be ever again. And every eye will see me. The only eyes that saw Jesus, especially after his resurrection, were just the ones he wanted to see. No one else. No one else. And, and before that, you had to be wherever he was. Where is Jesus today? I think he's in Jerusalem. We better go see him. If you're not over there with him, you cannot see him. But when Jesus comes back, it will be so public, it will be ever, ever, ever more public. That you will not have to go anywhere to see him. So Jesus, in order to help them understand what that would be like, he gives them uh, this future event. He gives them a preview and a very immediate event. So to prove that he can predict a far future event, he predicts a very, a very close, a very timely event to, within eight days. And so, boom, that's what takes place here. So he's transfigured. Now, we, we've discussed this before. Or I, not discussion. I just stand up here and talk, I know. But we, I've talked to you about this before. Jesus, not all indications of the Scriptures, we have no physical description of him. Uh, we know he was a man. We know he had a beard. We know he was Middle Eastern. We know he was Jewish. That's all we know about him. So, but we can conclude several things about it. We also know this, that there was nothing about him that was necessarily attractive. He was just a regular-looking person, just, just regular. Like he was neither, neither good-looking nor ugly nor something. Nor t- so, so what you've got here, so I've got a Middle Eastern man who works in an out di- or outside job. That's what carpenters did. And he had no sunscreen, and he's Jewish. So one thing we can be sure, he was not a white dude. <laughs> not a white dude. He's Jewish, so he's dark-featured, probably dark curly hair, certainly a beard, dark eyes, no, like I said, no sunscreen. He's going to be dark. He's going to be real dark. So a guy that with that kind of skin goes to looking like the, whiter than the pages on your, on your, in your Bible, yeah, that was a big change. So he's not very tall. He's, he's a regular-looking guy. He appears in every way as a regular man. They, they totally mistake him a man. That's a huge problem they have with him. We, we thought he would have some kind of halo over his head. I don't know, and some kind of aura. You claim to be the son of God. Where is all this? All that was hidden intentionally. Looks like a regular guy. Talk like a regular guy. Walk like a regular guy. Behaved, ate, slept like a regular person. But he was not. He was not. He was not. Three of them are yet to see how, how not regular he was. They get to see it. And he didn't go around, like I said, with some halo over his head. I know all of our old, the old pictures we have and some of the pictures we have in the Bible, somehow he has this you know, special look. And, of course, he's always Anglo in those things, just like, come on. No, he wasn't. He was not. The Bible says here, it says here in the Greek, literally, his morphe, his appearance, was metamorphed. You know, metamorphosis, what do you think of? I think of, a butterf- I think of a caterpillar and a butterfly, right? The metamorphosis, that's what takes place here. So his morphe, the way he appeared, was metamorphe. Literally means that it was changed from the inside. He didn't just change his clothes, he didn't put on makeup, I don't know, restyle his hair. None of that. From the inside out, he was transfigured, the word we use. It's metamorphe, especially in Matthew. Matthew's account says, his face shone like the sun. Wow. His clothing became as brilliant as lightning, reminiscent of of uh, something we were introduced to in in other places in the Bible, but also in Ezekiel. Ezekiel has this experience. So he's sitting by the river in in, in an exiled situation in Babylon, and while sitting there, he he sees these cherubim, these incredible celestial creatures with four different wings and eyes all over and two sets of arms and crazy stuff and feet like the hooves of calves. And it turns out they're just a preview. They're just a pre-show of what really is to be seen there. What he really sees is actually God. And he describes it here after seeing these cherubim. Notice what it says there. On that which resembled a throne, high up was a figure with the appearance of a man. So above these, these creatures. And I notice from the appearance of his waist and upward, gleaming like, met, like gleaming metal, looked like fire all around and within. And from the appearance of his waist and downward, I saw something like fire, and there was radiance all around him. So this is the appearance of God as, as uh, Ezekiel experiences here. It's interesting, Jesus appears the same way. You want to know why? Because it's him. He's the same guy. This is actually him. He's not a regular human. He's God himself. 
cloaked, hidden, only for special eyes. In this case, only three. Only three sets. He looks like this because Jesus is actually God. Light doesn't just shine on him. Light shines from him. From so, so, so to add to the scene, of course, we have now this Moses and Elijah come to visit. And why them? Well, they're special, right? I mean, sure they are. I mean, those are, those are big names in the Bible. Moses and Elijah are special, but why not David? I mean, I can think of a number of names that people that would think would be impressed if they were there. Uh, David, one of my favorite guys in the Old Testament is Daniel. Another favorite guy is Joseph. Why not Joseph? Why not Abraham? Crying out loud, he's the head of all the Jews. Why not some of these guys? Why, does, why are these two individuals of all the classics, and they're great people, they're some awesome people. I mean, hard to go wrong over there. Why, why, why uh, Moses and Elijah? Well, the answer is not so much in who they are. That's kind of what we start looking at. Well, I think Moses may be a little better than David, and David be a little, you know, Elijah a little better than, I don't know, Samuel or something. It's not about who they are as much as what they represented in the minds of the Jews. Remember, now Jesus, of course, is Jewish, but the more important thing is that Jesus isn't, this isn't for Jesus. Jesus didn't need this to happen to help him get, get through the day or anything, all right? Jesus is God. He knows he's God. He's the Son of God. It was for the three sets of eyes he brought with him. Three witnesses, Remember? Everything is to be established on the basis of two or three witnesses. This was the, the minimum that he brought with him. That's why he didn't go above that, because he's brought the minimum that's required to establish a testimony. And likewise, why are only two of all the people that God could have pulled out of heaven to, to, to come and also witness the, the majesty of Jesus? Why does he only pull two? Again, because you have a bare minimum being met there, both, both three and two in both cases. So, but again, back to these two. Why, why these two? Well, because of not so much who, what they, who they are, but as much as what they represent. Moses represents the law. In fact, he's the writer of the first five books of your Bible. He's a writer and editor of these first five books. They're called the law of Moses for that reason. He is crucial and critical to your scriptures. He's crucial and critical to the plans. In fact, Jesus says about Moses, he wrote about me. So, if he said, he says, he says to the Pharisees, if you listen to Moses, you would come to me, because he wrote about me. Moses is a witness of Jesus. He's a testifier. Jesus is on, on trial, if you will, and the testimony now we hear is from Moses, and then secondly, we're going to hear from Elijah. Why Elijah? Because Moses represents the, the law. Elijah represents the prophets. He's the preeminent representative of the prophets. So Moses wrote the law, and the prophets enforced it. They're like the police. That's what they are. So you have the legislature, that's Moses, and we have the police system, that's the prophets. The preeminent prophet is Elijah. So rep, it's not so much who they are as much as who these dudes represent. They represent the law and the prophets, which, by the way, is the way the Jew in that day referred to the whole Old Testament. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, Do not presume that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. What is he talking about? That's the way we would, we would just say the Old Testament. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. So these two guys who testify about me, the law and the prophets, that's what I've come to do, fulfill everything. That's why these guys are picked. They represent these, these two divisions as highlighted, like I said, by the law and the prophets here. They also represent the two modes of departing and being with the Lord. Moses, these guys had unusual exits. So Moses dies and is buried by God. Wow, couldn't we arrange it? It'd be a way cheaper funeral, don't you think? That's what it says. He died the regular way, and he was buried by God because for, there was reasons for that. We won't get into that. But and then Elijah, of course, doesn't die. He's caught up in a whirlwind on a chariot. Remember the story. So you have, he's, he's, he's raptured. So you have, the, how, do, how do believers leave this world? Well, you got two options. Everybody says, you know, I would like Jesus to come back today and we just be raptured. That's the way I want to do it, too. I don't want to suffer and die. I don't know about you. Most likely, though, it's probably what's going to happen. So the most of, up until, the, up until now, all the believers have had to suffer and die. I mean, with a few exceptions. We have Elijah being an exception to that. So these two guys represent the two modes by which we could exit this world. But I want you to notice something. Are they, they're completely fine, aren't they? So whether I died and God buried me, as the case of Moses, or whether I'm caught up in a chariot, it makes no difference. God still got me. I'm still good. These guys are fine. They're still, they're with Jesus. Isn't that great? 
So who cares how, truly, who cares how you leave here? It's just where you're going that matters. Just don't stop worrying about how you leave. Be concerned about where you're going. That's what matters. That's the issue. That's the bottom line here. It doesn't matter. God's going to take care of them. By the, by the way, notice they come back as themselves. They don't come back as, I don't know. They come back as two men. I don't know. You don't like yourself? You're going to have a problem with that. But you're coming back as yourself. God chose to pick. He picked you and made you the way you are. You may not like that, but you need, to, you, need to get, you need to get over that. Moses and Elijah had some issues, but they come back as themselves. Two men, prophet and a, and a, and a book writer, both these guys. And, and most likely also the two guys, if you're with us in our study in Revelation, there are two guys referred to as the two witnesses of Revelation 11. And if you want to refer to that, we have that back in our studies back in the fall. Back in the, I'm sorry, back in the earlier spring. But it's critical that we get the message of their appearing and disappearing. So they appear... And then they disappear. They appear and are talking with Moses, but as soon as Paul, Peter says something about, hey, let's just stay here. Let's make a tabernacle. Each of you can have your own little house. Immediately, God stops that process. Why does he do that? I mean, who wouldn't want to stay there? He stops it because there's a problem with it, and the problem is, is they've missed it. They're somehow thinking, oh, there's, there's an equivocation between Elijah, Moses, and Jesus. We've got three great men here. God says, no, you don't. You've got two great men and one son of God totally different he's not the same these guys are just like you knuckleheads and this one isn't he is altogether different 100 man that's all they've ever seen him all they've ever known him for but now they see him as 100 percent god of who he is notice it's it's reminiscent of what takes place here in hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 in the past the writer of hebrews says god spoke to our ancestors through the prophets there's moses and elijah and many times in various ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. Moses and Elijah, their whole purpose was to tell us Jesus is coming. The son of God is coming. Redemption is coming. Life eternal is coming. God is providing a way out of sin that you can't escape from into life that you can't get to. And that passage is going to be created through none other than a special, unique individual who's both 100% man and 100% God. He's spoken to us this finality. He's not going to say another thing other than, here is Jesus. That's it. So back to the same question. Who do you say that he is? Whom he appointed, notice, heir of all things, and through whom he made all the whole universe. He didn't do that with Moses and Elijah. These guys are just, they're some of the maids. They've been made just like you and I have. He's the maker. Altogether not the same. Moses, Peter's trying to equivocate the three of them. No, nuh-uh. God didn't allow it. Got to get the appearing and disappearing down correct. All that to say that Peter, James, and John have been asleep up until this point. So we talk about all this fun stuff, about all the cool stuff of Jesus shining his face and, I don't know, Moses and Elijah. And they've been, you know, they sleep through some of those important events in history. They sleep through this. They, Jesus takes them to the garden of Gethsemane and says, you know, pray with me for a little while. He wakes them up, I think, tw three different times. The last time he just lets them sleep. Actually, he only makes them two different times. The Bible says, you, in, 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 the Bible says Peter also was sleeping. He was, he was captured by Herod, if you remember, put in jail. He killed James, the other guy, the trio here. He killed James the day before. So probably he's sleeping the night before his execution, as far as anyone knows. And, and an angel, of course, if you know the story, he's chained between two guards in a, in a dungeon, and an angel comes and wakes him up, and the angel has to, has to, has to kick him. Has to, it says he struck him to wake him up. So, I mean, how cocky do you have to be, or how, how much of a sleep bub do you have to have on the night before your execution to be conked out like that? Well, that's Peter. He sleeps through this. He sleeps through all of it. You've got to love a guy who can sleep through stuff like that. The Bible, the word literally says that they were hypno. That's the word in Greek. It's the same word we get our hypnosis from. They were caught. They were hit by a sleepy bug. I mean, we can forgive them, can't we? I've been there. It just Once you get there, you can't, there's nothing else you can do. So, so not, knowing, not knowing what to say, Peter says something anyway. <laughs> know anybody like that? Sometimes we just get there. And, and he says the word kalos here, which really means ex it's, it's excellent for us to be here, he says. It's great. It's so cool. We're going to stay. Let's just stay right here. I mean, who would want to stay? You're finally seeing Jesus for who he really is. 
You're seeing these incredibly famous individuals from the Old Testament who, who you have looked up to as a young Jewish person all your life. Who would want that to stop? Well, God did, apparently. God wanted it to stop. Because Moses and Elijah weren't near as important as... You don't need to see Moses and Elijah ever again. It doesn't, they don't matter anymore. What matters is Jesus. What matters is that they're just messengers. Jesus is the message. What matters is, is the fact that they were servants. Yeah, great, but Jesus is the king. What matters is they were witnesses, but Jesus was their testimony. That's what matters. That's what matters. That's what they got to get. And, and, and by the way, they get it. But it, it seems like anymore, most of the time, we don't. It's interesting, on the traditional site in Israel today, you can go to Mount Tabor. Mount Tabor, the northern part of Galilee area, is the traditional site where Jesus, and I don't know, we don't know for sure whether Jesus, where Jesus, which mountain Jesus was on when he was transfigured, but traditionally speaking, it's Mount Tabor. So guess what they did on Mount Tabor? They went and built three tabernacles. One for Moses, one for Elijah, one for, or opposite way, one for Moses, one for Elijah, one for Jesus. Just exactly what God told them not to do. Just exactly what and Peter was in the process of doing that, and God totally removed the whole vision and backed up and says, wait a minute. Remember, the cloud removes. They fall on their faces. And when they look up, they see, here's the words. In Matthew, it says, Jesus only. Jesus only. That's the real message. Yeah, all these people in the Bible, they're all important. They're, they're great and everything, and it's great that they did all that and great that God used them, but they were people just like us. But Jesus is not like them. Jesus only. Jesus is it. And he has to be it. And Peter, for sure, well, all the other guys, they got it too. But Peter, for sure, got it. Notice what he says here in Acts chapter 4 in his second sermon. He says this, Salvation is found in no one else. But there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Isn't that an interesting phrase there, must be saved? So you must be saved, that means you can't save yourself. So you're out there drowning in the ocean. And I tell you, you, you must be saved. What does that mean? You can't swim in, that's what it means. You're going under and you can't rescue yourself. So we, we gotta, you got to get a grip with that. See, this whole question of who is Jesus, well, you have to understand this. He's your only way out. That's it. Salvation is found in no one else, and you must be saved. So, so the question of who is Jesus, who do you say that I am, as Jesus asked the question, I said, critical that you know the right answer. It's absolutely critical. I want to ask you if you would... I want to ask you if you would bow your heads and close your eyes with me, and I want us to think about this critical question. The critical question, who is Jesus? Who is he? Just a man? No. Good teacher? Uh, miracle worker? Great example? If that's all he is, then you're going to die in your sins. And only the, only, if, on the other hand, he is indeed the Son of God. He is the, the majestic King living in unapproachable light, the same one who came down to take your place. He is the God who loves you, the God who wants to forgive you, the God who offers you salvation. But see, something has to change for you, and that change is an attitude, that, that, that mindset of not this knowing that he is the Savior, but that he is your Savior. I wonder if you wouldn't call to him in your heart of hearts right now and say, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. I want you to be my Savior, saving me, God, because I can't save myself. Because salvation is found in no one else but you. I want you to be my Savior. Lord, I thank you so much that you hear all who call upon you. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, you say, will be saved. They call to you as Savior, because that's what you are. Not willing that any should perish, this glorious appearing, this horrible worldwide public event, so, so terrible that people would rather be crushed by rocks than to see it. It doesn't have to be like that. You want to rescue them now. You want them to turn to you now. You prefer to forgive. You prefer to have mercy. You're a God. That's, that's, that's who you are, not judgment. 
A judgment's a last resort. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you, Lord, as you said to the, to the woman caught in adultery, neither do I condemn you because of what you've done, Lord. We thank you. Thank you for rescuing us. Thank you for being who you are and helping us understand it. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.